I know we're all eager to engage in this course. We don't have a culture of silence. We are very vocal people, and we are going to be sharing our thoughts and feelings. The first speaker, in fact, started out by delineating, explaining to us the nature, as he saw it, of the crisis created by the closure, the examined social ramifications, psychological ramifications, economic ramifications. The second speaker, speaking from the perspective of Gaisuku, established the rationale in terms of Gaisuku's position. We have a third speaker who said, okay, fine, let's think in terms of what we can do. And Dr. Halley came and said, look, we need to move towards diversification. We had a very young speaker who in fact came and said, maybe we need to start paying some attention to issues of leadership. We need to move away the whole idea of why is it that persons work hard and still primarily working hard isn't as productive as it can be. And then from an economic perspective, we had a very enthralling um, presentation that placed things into context and highlighted marketing. Now, we also had commentaries coming through in terms of the need for the private sector and the need for engaging the private sector into sugar in the context of Diana. But I know you have a lot to say. And it's about you, because the thing about dialogue, dialogue has been a part of every culture in society. You know, it's only now that we move into these systems whereby we tend to sit back and allow persons to speak for us. So we're going to be speaking for ourselves and collectively, we are moving towards more than anything else, not just discussing the crisis, but I want to hear some dialogue in relation to solutions. Now who's going to start? Good afternoon, everyone. I am Jackie Murray, and I'm heading the Institute of Distance and Continuing Education. I am happy to be here. I sat and I listened to Dr. Grayson Halley and all the other comments, and I sat here thinking instead of doctor saying that um, he's waiting on the government to do things, I'm thinking that him and a few colleagues could come together prepare a proposal, look at all those areas where the hydroponic farming could be done and um, put that inside. But we know if we're talking divestiture that we're going to have to be talking about retraining and there's where IDC could come in. And so in your proposal, <laughs> so in your proposal, I'll be happy to work with you to come up with some short courses because we're going to have to train people now to do that. Training is going to be easy in this area though because the people in this area, they know a lot about fishing and farming. They would have been doing that small in the trenches and even as adults. And so I don't think we're going to have problems training them. And I do agree with my young friend over there that we need to take action. And I think this is the kind of action we could take. And Dr. Thomas saying you, have, you said something I wanted to say in terms of marketing. When I heard, oh, you can make all this fish and grow all this fish, and we're not a fish eating people, then I was thinking, who buying it? Maybe in your proposal too, you could explore the markets that are quite likely to buy and the standards under which that fish or those fish will have to be grown in order to satisfy international requirements. The person who talked about the infrastructure and value added, I have a question for you. When you say value added, what do you mean? Yes. Sorry. Sorry. Okay, what I was saying with regards to value added, the future of Daisuko or sugar production is not in producing raw sugar. It's producing sugar with value added. That means the plantation white sugar, 
Um, the energy from the sugar cane, our crop is sugar cane, so we have to look to extract as much value from that as we can. But it's important to note that Blairmont in 2007 produced sugar at 11 cents a pound. So we can do it. It's not that we can't produce it at a world market price. So we need to get the CARICOM market. Now, the domestic market right now is around $500 a pound, when the world market price is, no, we sold, we're selling sugar for $250 a ton. The, world, the local price is 500 so we need to package this sugar. If you've ever go to overseas, you see those small little sachets? If we produce sachets alone with the current production, we will probably not need Exxon. It's a very, very profitable business, but you have to do it correctly and you have to find a market. And this is what Dr. Singh was saying. You need to find the market and commodities, you need to add value to it. That's what we have to produce. Everything is from sugar cane. I was just um, wondering if you had the same concept of value added. Because you need to go beyond that. It's 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 to me, when we were talking about value added, it was about what the young chairman here would have talked about what is going to be happening in Bancroft. Is that the place? Yes, yes in terms of seeing what you can actually do with sugar. So I understand your concept, which is not too far from it, but what are some of the other things that Gaisuko could take sure to do, maybe set up a refinery or set up a, um, uh, I'm, losing words, I'm losing my words here, but set up an establishment that would enable you to produce something that is made from sugar. And I thank you for listening to me. Just a quick one on that. A lot of these things, um, let's say, okay, production of ethanol, producing a distillery, industrial products, plastics from sugar, housing tiles, you can produce tiles from sugar, the cellulose could be used as a vast amount of products. But these things cost investment, capital investment. It's not that we can't do it, but we don't have the capital to do it. If we produce industrial alcohol and export it, or ethanol, if we can do it cheap enough, we can make a product. If we produce ethanol, and have it eat at 10% law in Guyana, all gasoline has to have 10% ethanol, we can supply the local market with all the ethanol. But the problem is you have to do it at a cost that makes economic sense. And when we export the ethanol, oil is at $100 a barrel, it still did not make economic sense for us to produce ethanol. Oil is still cheap. You get a lot of bang for your buck from oil. Thanks once again on the presenter. So say there's a comments and a request from as a university. First I talk to a chairman. Chairman said because lot of SUSI and depression and anxiety upon the region six because of producing the estate. I cannot say because of producing the estate. Because even now people are doing some kitchen garden. But I say even I want I am going to market, Saturday market, now all vegetables are cheap. That means all people are starting to do the homework. So what I am saying, as a director of Belvis Campus, as you are chairman of the Region 6, the Region 6, Region 5 doesn't have any recreation club, recreation activity. For example, Region 4, they have the gift mall, they have the swimming pool, now sadly they open the movie town. But in Belvis, the people are working, they don't have any relaxation. Region 6, Region 5 doesn't have it. Simply they sit down, what they say? They drink or smoke. And when they drink and smoke, they talk to each other because they don't have any other recreation. I ask you as a chairman, please think about making anyone entertain here. Terms of motivation, not for the gambling or drink water. Just to encourage the swimming pool or the athletic track. The people are go, the young circle go, spend the time. So, this I, I used to tell always, even my presentation, Guyana is a beautiful country. We can do everything that we can produce. But, if we have entertain this also way, we can minimize depression and suicide and also. That's why I request to you, okay, as a chairman. Second, Dr. Hale, this is an excellent presentation. What Dr. Modi said, I fully understand what she said. My question is also the same thing. When you have the plan, our white chancellor always ready to support. If you want to do the training, workshop, 
Or what do we want in the short course? He always said, what you should do, we can triple the proposal. We have a research and publication company, Babies Campus, submitted. We will support you and we will allow to the go regions. Where we go, we can support you as a, we always support to this kind of activity. I appreciate what you say, 100 percent. Big up for Vice Chancellor and the Assistant Director, we will fully support for you. Please bring the proposal, whatever you want, short course, workshop, training, or you want like a six week, eight week for people, I am very supportive of Big up for Vice Chancellor. And the third question to go to the, this is another question, such comments. <laughs> Sorry. This uh, regarding the marketing, okay? I said Guyana is very good side. Guyana, very good trust of microorganism. You can grow any kind of sugar cane. It will grow nicely. But what uh, the assistant director, sorry, my director said, IDC, we help make a market value, okay? Why you people are looking only Europe Union? What of the Asian countries, North America or Africa? Other countries will explore it. There is a marketing. This people need sugar more. So if you do it, only you cannot depend on one entity for export. I understand you said the 700 and 200. So we have to explore different. Asian countries need all sort of things, sugar. This is one of the stable food for Asian country, North America, all country. Please look after. And the last one was the, from private sector. I understand 100% true. Other than Guyana, all over country they have the private sector running the factories. No common running the factory. So we should give the chance to the private sector how they perform. Because we have vast land, unused virtual land we have it. We should give the private sector to use, not only really sugar cane, what the research and the true. We don't have sufficient rice to grind the milk to export. If you do it, that's a good thing. These are my requests and thank you so much, sir. To respond to the concern about marketing, I think uh, so I should have that uh, clear that up so that the nation can understand. Um, China being the, the greatest producer of aquaculture products, fish and other uh, aquatic uh, animals, they have a problem with water, as I mentioned before. And they have a problem uh, maintaining the market because of quality. Right? They like our opportunity. Right? We find that Africa have waterways, but the waterways run through a lot of other African countries, and the pollution load is very high. So they too cannot produce the export, so they only can produce for themselves. Guyana, our waterway is unique. It's come from the Amazon, it is crispy, pristine and pure, right? So we don't have a problem of water quality. Hence, we have no problem to market what else we can produce. We can compete and win those markets that China is uh, making hundreds of millions of US dollars each year on. Here lies our opportunity in terms of our marketing or agriculture uh, project. Now, in terms of the ecotourism, uh, Dr. Jones mentioned we have no recreational facilities. But while doing this aquaculture, you can imagine our China water. You have 200, 100, 200 acres of land, and in the middle of this water, this, uh, this pond, you have a nice island with cabins and walkway around the fish pond where people go with their family. Right? And they spend weekends. They go from state to state, from state to state, and they go to these places just because they want to feel the, the relaxing feel of water around them. Right? That relaxes them. And they think that gives them long longevity and so on. And ease their stress. Imagine your children playing and walking on these walkways that they have with bamboo and sticks and so on, feeding the fish and they enjoy seeing the fish uh, play. It relaxes everyone. Build family life, right? That kind of recreation. It is easy to sell such a product, and it is easy to sell fish coming from that from such a product. 
if I may. It's always interesting. It's always interesting to hear this conversation when the politicians speak, which is my friend, and uh, the other persons who are actually involved in the business uh, industry speak. So when the government and the opposition they have a conversation around sugar, it's an interesting dialogue because. I live in Burbies, and you, I know about domestic violence and suicide and social workers here. Uh, so I do know, I can't recall the, this, the upsurge of these um, negative social you know, issues. What I do know as a Burbies, and I think my director actually spoke to it, is that we lack the recreational and other social facilities that are needed to create the, the kind of environment. The uh, chairman and I usually meet up at the mall, the gift land mall. You know, we both go there for relaxation because we don't have to in Burbies. And it would be an opportune time for Burbisians to have all those kinds of things when we speak about the development within the region. But particularly um, what I enjoyed is hearing the people in the industry, the private sector, uh, Mr. Nampasa, who talks about what we need to do. You know, I think we need to take the politics out of sugar. For me, if we can separate this, then we will get to those people. Because we've got to make a profit. We need to make a profit if we're to develop our country. If we're to develop our region, we've got to make money, right? And Mr. Nampasa is a good example of how making money works. He's in the private sector. I would love to know that my friend here, Ryan, who belongs to the Burbies Chamber of Commerce, could really mobilize the private sector to take ownership of the sugar industry and all the other things that are happening. Here we can't be, be dependent any longer. And that's what we've come, become within the sugar industry. And this is not saying that I'm not hurting for people who've lost jobs. We, you feel it. People need to be able to support their families and all of that. We want, it must happen, but it must not be a culture of dependency. We've got to change that. And the, so, Ryan, your job as a current chair is cut out for you. You've got to mobilize uh, the sector. You've got to mobilize us. You've got to talk to the good, good practices like Lampusa. Our vice chancellor always talk about that. Let's find and chronicle the best practices. Uh, where are the markets, where are all those things? We can't hold on to the politics and fight that political line. I mean, it's, it, it is useful when you come to election time. But when our people are feeling it, we've got to sit down and reason out what will work, what will make sense, what will make Derby strive. Uh, I'm happy I was sitting here and Chairman is whispering to me, and I know he's going to make a, a, a plan just now. I'm not going to to allow that to, to make that for him. But we've got to talk about practical ways of changing our landscape as it is. It cannot work anymore what it was. We've got to move differently. We cannot be, no longer be dependent. Thank you. Let me, let me say this. In 10 minutes, what I sought to do basically is to highlight the effects of the closure vision. I couldn't. I mean, I, I, in 10 minutes, I can't be dealing with Right, and this is what I was asked to do. That is what I did. Now, I also have a lot of experience in terms of the alternatives. I know the alternatives. Everything you have talked about here, I know about. Nothing is new to me. The problem is how you implement it. There is where I would like to challenge you, Dr. Holly, as a university professor. I will give you whatever land you want in bodies. You just submit it to me tomorrow morning. And I want, and I need to know you come back here, I want to see what you achieve in that. That's, that, that's how we got to move here. Right? Because we can yeah. sit up as academics and discuss things at museum. You know, that's, we are good at academics, are pretty good at that. You know, ideas, we have lots of ideas. Practicality and implementation is another story. Right? So I would like to challenge you that. You get covered with them, I give you the love. Tomorrow morning. The other thing, that just quickly before, I agree, Professor, that we need to do a lot more things to bring our social practices up because we need to develop our people. But I just want to bring an experience to you. I visited not so long ago 
the a sugar factory in Florida. It's called U.S. Sugar. Uh, because I have a relative working there. And that factory is owned privately by some Cubans. And 100% sugar cane that supplies that factory are farmers cane. They don't plant no cane at all. 100%. They got two lines of production. Two lines. One is for sugar cane. They grind for seven months in a year and produce one million tons of sugar. Then the other couple months in a year, they produce orange juice because they got another line of production. In the very factory, just a couple of changes, and they can produce orange juice. They got another set of farmers who are producing oranges for that particular factory. So it can work. It's not a detail work, but we need a lot of investment into it. Right? And you know, that, when I looked at that, the automated stuff and that thing, about six people under that whole factory. Six people. That's the way you got to develop. That's the way you got to develop. So we got all these ideas. We know we've gone around the world and so on. We see what's happening. But our problem in this country here is implementation. And that's how we got to get it from it. Just, just, just a quick one on, on, on that. Um, personally, not on behalf of the company, but I'm very supportive of Dr. Singh's Let the Market Society. One of the things about sugar markets is that it's not a fair market. Last month, India has 20 million tons of sugar stored because they subsidize, every state subsidizes the sugar. They have 40 million farmers. So they have all the sugar. In fact, mills in, in India now are stopping to take sugar because they don't need it anymore. So if they dump that on the world market, there's some serious trouble. There's overproduction. What you're saying about the factories, I've been to that same factory, right? We can do it here. The problem is the capital investment. If we mechanize, in Brazil, if visited farms, they have one man for every thousand hectares. That means Gaisuko currently, all the estates, we need 50 people to run that company. Right? That produce all that sugar that we're currently doing. What are we going to do with the labor? And I'm very supportive of the private sector. The private sector has to take the initiative. And I admit, when governments get involved in it, they, they tend not to be doing it in necessarily the best interest of everybody, but the private sector has to take the initiative in these things. And we, we have had some expressions of interest, and I would love to see the private sector take a far more active involvement. But once again, a lot of these things, these plans, come down to economics. Can you do it cheap enough, as good as in Asia? There's no problem selling the sugar. Sugar is very cheap. If you double our production, I can sell it tomorrow morning. That's very easy. But what can we produce at that and make an economic return? With? And that's the problem. It comes, just comes on. A lot of these business plans, as, as Mr. Arbogan has said, we've all heard it before. So why has the private sector the last 50 years gone? The reason is, and I believe, private sector, people understand where they can make a profit. They are not going to go into sugar because they know they're not going to need, if they want to be profitable, they're going to need a hundred people to run their Monte estate and two people in the factory. My name is Timothy Colin Corn, my name is Rob Ford. I'm a PhD student at the University of Vienna. A very good evening to everyone, Vice Chancellor Griffith, Regional Chairman David Ardman, Mr. Gill, and Dr. Haley, Dr. Singh, and others. I have three questions. Dr. Thomas Singh, my question takes into consideration your expertise on new institutional economics and emanates from commodity prices and the impact of oil and gas. In 2014, we were aware that the price of oil declined on the international market from 70 US dollars to 48 US dollars and caused an impact on the value of percent GDP, uh, increasing it to 620 to 650 million United States dollars. Um, that uh, is in comparison to the situation in 2013 where the Thomas Domar calculus has shown the value of percent GDP based on the units to be 380 million United States dollars. However, there was also another impact and that of uh, the institutional causes. In 2006, the European Agriculture Council decided to increase the price of sugar from 300 and 35 pounds sterling per ton to 523 pounds sterling per, uh, per ton. 
and that is because the sugar coefficient um, for sugar beet was at the time 10, and the sugar coefficient for sugar cane, or sugar from sugar cane, uh, was 14. However, the situation has changed since then because of climate change, causing the sugar coefficient for sugar beet to now increase to 12, and that for um, sugar cane to 15, and in effect, causing an increase in the price of sugar from the previous situation as it were, um, to for a 10% increase in the price of sugar from the previous situation. I note um, in your presentation you mentioned that the price of sugar have now declined to 200 US dollars per ton. My question, Dr. Thomas, is how can Guyana negotiate for an increase in the price of sugar from based on the institutional situation that we have today? My second question, very quickly, is to Mr. Gavin Ramnarayan, and it takes into consideration your expertise in tropical and subtropical crop science. Uh, Mr. Gavin Ramnarayan, uh, has Kaisuka done any studies to adjust the factory sugar coefficient from 14 uh, to now 15 based on the um, organic structured organic formula for, for carbohydrates, which would show that the, um, the verificant for based on the impact of climate change and the subsidy of $30 billion would coincide with um, an, a 15 coefficient instead of 14. My third question, I do not want to delay on this, my third question is for Dr. Haley, and it's based on Dr. Haley's expertise in environmental monitoring. Dr. Haley, has Gaisuko considered the impact of pesticides and bioaccumulation of pesticides in fatty tissues of fish um, in your agriculture, aquaculture diversification plan. I would recall in 2016, July 2016, the Parliamentary uh, Sectoral Committee on Economic Services uh, requested information and were, was advised that the diversification plan for aquaculture should instead be um, that for rice production due to potential um, risks which may exist in uh, pesticides that were applied to um, the soils in the sugar industry over a number of years. Thank you very much. Thank you so very much. I'll take the opportunity to answer you and to make a few remarks as well. Um, regarding negotiating the price, let me say, first of all, that um, I think you raised an important and interesting question for one reason. It is that whereas the world had embraced the World Trade Organization, multilateral, multilateralism, rules-based trades, low tariffs or breaking down the tariffs, things have changed dramatically. I think we all who've been following the news would know that it's almost as if, led by um, the United States probably, we have abandoned uh, multilateralism and rules-based trade. It seems, I mean, the European Union has reacted violently to the tariffs imposed by the United States, just today. So, what I'm saying is that maybe an opportunity exists yet for us to actually negotiate a different price. But having said that, so, so, so we, we need to understand the terrain of trade. It is changing. And uh, uh, Gavin made the point that maybe the mistake that we made, um, or some of the mistakes we made, had to do with the fact that the European Union was imposing some conditions on us. Um, this is the way the world operates. If I said markets are brutal, so is international um, aid. Uh, so, so, so the international aid agencies. And, and we are sometimes like puppets. We have to be strategic in what we do. And one of the things we do in being strategic is think in the game. Work ourselves backwards from the end. There's a great book actually called the, um, it's not the art of strategy. It could be the art of strategy. Anyway, the idea is 
let's recognize that we are not in sugar production as Kaisuko or as a private sector entity um, producing rice but, or, or, or sugar. But when we produce, there are hundreds of other people producing. When we make a marketing decision, there are hundreds of others who are making different marketing decisions. So, so, so that's the, as we think, negotiating price. I want to suggest that the framework ought to be that the, 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 um, the trade game is changing, number one, might yield some opportunities, and number two, we are in, in, in any exported industry, we are, we are engaged in warfare, in point of fact. There is a strategic interaction, it is not us alone, there are other actors. So that's my, that's my response, I think it's a great question and it raises, it reminds us that this, this terrain of trade is, is changing. Um, I want to make two brief comments. One, I've heard before, this is not hitting me by the way, because it is true, um, I've heard before that capital investment is needed, where does it come from? This, in point of fact, was said of um, Limai, well, Gaimai, whatever it was, at the point of privatization. We need 100 million US dollars, we can't find it, let us still push up the thing down. Um, I know there are politics involved in this debate here, so let me just say that um, that was the only cabinet meeting I ever sort of attended, I was on the fringes, and um, I heard Chetty Jagan say something. He said, comrades, I'm not going to be committing political suicide. I'm not shutting it down. <laughs> it was a very interesting comment. Um, you know, and I say that because I'm aware that we're talking politics. But when that was said, the point was, we need investment to do everything that we want to do. We can transform this industry, but where will we get the investment? So, one big answer to that is that there are oil revenues on the horizon. I did tell you, I'm not going to tell you much in my presentation of what we could do about oil revenues. Um, and I can't really begin to develop that topic except to say that the literature says that when we denude our natural capital, when we use up this, especially non-renewable resources, our best practice would require us, our best strategy would be to invest in other forms of capital. There are other forms of capital, physical capital, we want equipment, we should be doing that, roads, but there's social capital, investment in trust building, investment in social cohesion. There is human capital, and that is key. How do we get people to make better poverty avoiding decisions in the cases of poverty, but we need investment in human capital. And we can source our investment funds from those very oil revenues that we will have. We've got to be very, very careful about what we do with those oil revenues. And finally, just want to clarify that I'm not saying we must market the thing. I'm saying instead that the first decision in in production ought to be what will, who will buy this thing, you know? Or put differently, the first marketing decision would be what should we produce that would be sensible to put on the market that people will buy. I do not embrace the view that we should um, necessarily go and do project proposals for agriculture because first of all I do not think the solution to any corporate problem or crisis is a project solution. I think Aisuka has operated on the basis of projects. It cannot continue to do so. Um, because bright people, academics, very bright people, very often come up with brilliant ideas that cannot stand the test of the market. Secondly, there is a whole massive amount of uncertainty surrounding the investment decision. There are property rights issues. I mean, if we did invest, will Kaisuko come and take our cages? We've got to sort out the incentives, we've got to sort out the contracts, the rights, ensure that 
we reduce uncertainty as much as possible and ensure that we can transport this fish to China and sell it and make a profit. We don't have to make a profit in sugar, by the way. ExxonMobil makes its smallest marginal profit on its upstream activities. The reason it loves Guyana is because the production is low cost here. But the real bank is in the up downstream activities, the value and the added activities. Um, yes, indeed, we do have to think value added. But let's not just begin to think of bright ideas. I would say let us ask our private sector to help us think about the things that would um, face the test of the market. Because the decision is never just about aquaculture. It's about insecticides. It's about the arrangement of our irrigation fields. It's about cooperation. It's about people choosing not to come to work and not to go looking and getting relaxation from something they hate doing or hate seeing, killing fields, and that sort of thing. So I end by saying that the problem is indeed conflict, complex. <coughs> Let us not trivialize it. Let's not think that we can come with solutions. Dr. Bones, I do not agree that culture can be changed just by building an entertainment center. I think they're deep-seated, entrenched beliefs and values. And we do have to take them on board seriously. Thank you. I don't think I need to speak again. <laughs> the second question will be very quickly answered. Um, we have two members of our base, Superstar from Albion and from Lima. If you choose to visit one of these factories, you understand that we are possibly the most inefficient factories in the world. Our newest factories are from the 1950s. Everything in our factory is inefficient. That's why I'm saying we have to do a major investment. Our boiler, or these old low pressure boilers, they're very inefficient. Our set of fuel baskets are, if you go into our factories, as I, if you were here earlier on, we had a gentleman from England, from the EU came, and he wanted to take photographs of this equipment because he had never seen them actually working except in old historic books. And that's the kind of things we have to upgrade. So, and the other one with regards to um, the use of insecticides you're talking about. As a head of research, I have to sign a piece of paper allowing people to use insecticides. It's been 20 years, it's never, ever been signed. Daisuku has a strict ban on the use of insecticides. We have a biological control program, which happens to be the most successful biological control program for insects in the entire sugar world. So there's a strict ban, so there's no, if you go and test the soil, you'll not, you'll not find any insecticides. In fact, we did some at Wales, and we found insecticides remaining there in parts per billion from the 1950s, when they used to use some very dangerous things. But I have to authorize use of insecticides. I've never done it, I will never ever do it, because we have a very active biological control program that controls all of our pest disease. On the same note, uh, concerning the water quality, uh, you would say, I would say I did some research on water quality at, uh, within Gaisuko and along the 19 and so on. Um, yes, we do have some water quality. I do not agree with uh, the comment that we do not have water quality, but we do have a water quality problem in terms of heavy metal within the water, within the waterway. What happened is that the heavy metal, because Kaisuko had a practice of using heavy fertilizers and so on, and the previous use, as you mentioned, of these insecticides and so on, both all these agrochemicals have uh, traces of heavy metals. These heavy metals tend to persist in the, in the environment for hundreds of years. But these small quantities that they are in, are very dangerous. Why they are dangerous? Because they tend to accumulate in these fish species until they reach a uh, dangerous level, right? Or they can also, when we eat the fish or consume the, the vegetables that they use the water to, to take to water the plants, when you eat those vegetables, the vegetables, it can accumulate also in us, right? 
So this minute level over our 50, 60 year lifespan accumulate and then they become dangerous for us, right? So despite the, uh, they say that it's, it's low, it is a concern, right? That, those are things that have to be into a project for Kaisuko, right? To utilize the Kaisuko land for aquaculture. Additionally, to Mr. Armgan concern, um, when you say you're gonna give the land, give the land isn't it, isn't it to, to, to bring out uh, aquaculture to what I'm talking about. Land alone isn't it. It, it takes a lot of other players, engineers, actually, we are talking about millions of fish in one, um, at one farm, as they do in China, not 3,000 pieces of fish. Right, so they can, <laughs> you know, we want to make sure that we can hold a market. We have to hold a market to compete with the big player. We don't want to go in this, uh, go in this um, small. We're talking about diversification of our estate. Right? We are talking about the diversification of our estate, not of a little um, farm. So we, we have to go big to compete with China and those at the, and maintain those markets. We cannot do it on a small scale and expect it to be uh, 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 the diversification for Kaisuko and that's such a big company. Right? Right? So, what I'm <laughs> so what I'm saying, it takes actuary, it takes engineering, it takes in more environmentalists, it takes marketing, it takes so many other things that, were, that you see coming out here. But the idea, what I'm selling, what I'm selling today is the idea, and I'm willing to work with whoever wants to um, think that I go forward with that idea. Uh, anybody else? There anyone else would like to make a contribution? I just want to throw one thing out while we're on this. A lot of emphasis has been placed on the economic, which I value, marketing, etc., which I value. I am concerned about the psychological and the psychoanalytic. I happen to have been in Linden when Bauxite collapsed, and I've never seen so many young faces in my life. I realized then that the education <coughs> system did not prepare persons to cope change, failure, pain, etc. I'm seeing those spaces too in the context of shipping. And somewhere I think the challenge we have is also what we can do in terms of our education system to gear persons towards dealing with change, pain, failure, etc. Currently, I'll make a bold statement to say we're not there. And I think while we're thinking of things, we should also focus on the people. And I think I'm thinking strategically about what changes we need to make in the curriculum towards these are lessons for us. Whether it be bauxite, whether it be sugar, a few years from now it might be oil, I'll fish it. But I'm saying we have got to prepare our people to deal with change, to deal with pain, too often we are gearing people towards success. Okay. I was not planning to speak today, but um, I really think this is perhaps one of the most meaningful and interesting Terrapin and Dave talks we've had. Even though we haven't had a multitude in the room, I'm sure a lot of people will be posting online um, because they don't want to be seen in public speaking about what is supposed to be a, an explosive, controversial, and maybe political topic. I want to say two or three things because I'm an activist type of scholar. One of them is that everything dies, and we must learn when it dies to accept its death and to understand that from death comes other things. So that's the first thing. The second thing is a really fundamental question. I've been spending a lot of time in Paris and I have developed a great uh, a kind of empathy for this region because of what I've seen um, in the field. But I believe the region has some work to do. 
And that work is to define for yourselves what does Burbies want for Burbies. It's not about sugar. It's not about oil. It's not about bauxite. It is about creating now, or at least articulating maybe now, what the vision for Burbies is. What does Burbies want for Burbies? It's not for the government to do this, any government. Because I personally believe that if you give the government too much work to do, it's not going to be able to do any work, like anybody else. You have to be able to go to a person or an entity and say, this is what we want. We've sat down in a room, we've taught this through, this is what we see, Burbies, where, this is where we see Burbies going, because we know it best. And so I'd like to propose, as I've been doing, not wearing my UG hat, please let me uh, disclaim, I am, this I'm speaking as myself, um, that Burbies gets their minds together in a room, and I'm sure UG would be happy to facilitate this at least give it a space, and some people may be able to sit down in that room, and maybe over a day or two, work out what Burbies wants from Burbies. And I believe that if you start to articulate what Burbies wants for Burbies, all the various opportunities and pieces and plans that are in the room and outside of the room will become doable. Because you know why? You will see clearly where you're going and you'll begin to figure out how to do it. And what is the best idea for now, but maybe what is the best idea for 10, 10 years from now, 15 years from now. Because it's not going to be about sugar. Even if you save sugar now, I don't believe that 4,000 people should be working in sugar. Not in the way that they're working in sugar now. I asked this question three years ago. And some people took me off of a group that they were discussing sugar. Because I, the first question I asked was, are these people meant to be doing sugar for the rest of their lives? Were they born to do sugar? We have a caste system in this country where people must be doing sugar, 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 sugar for the whole every generation. And then off the group, they never sent me another email. That's okay, right? <laughs> but that's fine. But I'm serious. That it wasn't a disrespectful question. I was really asking a, a serious existential question which is, can people who were cutting cane do something else? Can they become welders, for instance? If you read today's paper, or uh, there's a business thing that came out this morning, some of my friends from high school were circulating, right? It came out today on Diana. The headline was, the country that did not know it won the, won the lottery. Thomas, they quote you in that article that came out today. In, in Forbes Business Magazine, they quote Troy as well, I'll send it to you. I was reading it as it was coming up here. And they were talking about how many people are needed to service the industry that's now. How many hundred of taxi drivers? How many hundred welders? How many hundred people who will have to build <coughs> pipes? How many people who will be needed in service industries? Right? My point is, we can save sugar, but it's how we save sugar. We can save bauxite, maybe, maybe not. But it's how we save the people of the region. And you have to decide what you want. And I believe it's time for you to pull together a caucus of people in this, in this county and hammer that out. It may be imperfect, but you can do it because you kind of started here, right? And that's just what I want to say.
I'm a manager at Daisuko, fee manager, and um, I have recently moved from Umoa, which was one of the six stores, to, to Ali. And it pains me for the emotion, the outpouring of emotion whenever one stop or speak or show. And I think those, those are the facts that most times come our judgment. Um, it is difficult to work. And um, some of the key factors that are being discussed, the human factors, human resources. Um, if one were to examine the industry, I've uh, done an analysis at the moment, then the most people is in the post. And the age of the average worker, they say would not have survived, even if we had been too little. I'm at Albion, I'm currently looking at that, and it's age. The workers are age. They would not be sustainable, despite the fact that we want to continue, continue in sugar. Okay? Um, additionally, that is to did, did an impact assessment of the closure, the effects of the closure. And out of that, born three key factors the economic resilience program, a social program, and the environmental program. The NDA was mentioned, and the environmental aspect or impact covers that program where Daisuko generally drains the entire coast of Diana. Okay? Daisuko yeah. drains the entire coast of Diana. We have never received previously prior to now a cost on that. NDA, the premier institution that governs British irrigation, has taken up that, that, that mantle. If you were to imagine Wales, and more skeleton rows are being digested or diversified. Drainage is drainage and irrigation still be a key factor. Now, one were to imagine an investor taking rows off, he would not look so after drainage and irrigation. Five inches of rainfall and the rows all would be up. Okay? Because canes, they're sustainable. They can survive flooding for a length period. So it was incumbent on the government to take over the mantle of drainage irrigation. Basically, what the ISO does is to maintain that environmental aspect, that space, and we reimburse for it. And myself and my colleague at the back, we have just completed a trainer's trainer program coming out of the economic services and economic impact of, of the ISO. We are the consultants, or a couple of you consultants in there from NIRAS, and basically, Exploring the possibility of retraining like school workers. We have done surveys across all those estates and they have identified economic ventures that we want to get into. We have also done in Mexico the best models in the country, be it dairy, beef, pork, okay, the ones that are key and would not have too much of marketing issues like poultry can be or vegetables. And um, we have started retraining workers who want to get into those schools. It's still continuing. We have had at Wales and in more training of courses in um, cookery, sewing, and the JTC as I was trained a batch of courses in, in plumbing. We're currently a program that's supposed to be starting in bodies with um, electrical installation. And those elaborate is not the guys who have several 2,000 employees or 4,500 to be exact and not looking at economic ventures that they can be involved in. So I just want to clear the, clear the floor on that. Um, relative to Ms. Nanta said, did speak about um, land, and that was the fear. That is still the fear that most of the private sectors or persons may want to get into the ISO, not so much for a continuation of sugar, but for the real estate. Um, what is needed here in Guyana is to focus more on improving the yield. Yes, for the first time it has been mentioned that rice now is producing about 40 bags per acre. Is that the idea of or the optimum yield of the soil that we bring, we bring rice? You need to take it up rather than expanding on acreage on the cultivation. Okay, the economic venture of the soil is, is, is critical in agriculture and we should be doing that at the moment. The other thing is um, the technical institution or a tertiary institution, have we really put people out there to pick up the in agriculture? They're not young person out there in agriculture. Even if you were to look across the landscape, apart from sugar, 
forests we need to make agriculture attractive, that people can get into agriculture and produce one to go to agriculture. The other thing where I think our institution has failed us is that um, we, all of us, leave those institutions and want to get into the white collar, sitting in an office being a desk. It shouldn't be like that. We need to develop what we tell and there's a common term functionally literate. To be able to move from the the um, the book work to make it work practical outside. I think um, we, we, we need to do that more. Okay? Agriculture is not just about sitting behind the desk all the time. Even if you use all the technology as a deal Brazil was mentioned. The Florida was mentioned maybe in Louisiana, but you can sit in an office remotely operate a field, but then there's some point in time that you need to physically be in the problem to examine what is happening. I think you need to, to get into that sphere. Thank you. Yes. Uh, we're now going to have the vote of thanks, and after this, we will continue our discourse of snacks. Good evening, everyone. It has been a very fruitful discussion, I can say so. And for those who are here, while we might be while we might be few, I do know that we had a lot of ideas thrown around the room, and of course, we are very appreciative to everyone who contributed to this. The university wishes to extend sincere thanks to the sponsors for this event. The Vice Chancellor, Professor Ivor L. Griffith. Director UGBC, Professor Gomathia Nayagam. <laughs> to Romania. Say it again. Gomathia Nayagam. To Romania. Director, please forgive me. <laughs> Deputy Director UGBC, Ms. Paula Henry, and staff at the University of Guyana Burbis campus the panelists and speakers who contributed to this evening's discussion already listed on the program, and special thanks is also extended to several persons who have consistently partnered with the university to make this series a success. These include the staff of the Little Rock Suites, the Deputy Vice Chancellor Pace, and staff, Ms. Aficia Esbran, Ms. Shovana Aziz, Ms. Christine Chamagir, Ms. Shamel Patrick, Ms. Tara Smith, Ms. Merlene Gopal and intern, Chanelle Wilson, Ms. Gwyneth George and staff of the University of Vienna Learning Resource Center, Ms. Paulette Paul, PRO and staff of the Public Relations Department, the Personnel Officer, Mr. Jeffrey Walcott, the Registrar and staff of the Registry, Mrs. Denise Brown, Director, Center for Communication Studies, CCS, Mr. Orfeo Griffith of the CCS, the Local Media Corps, and Mr. Neil Suklau and staff of Impressions Inc. We are also grateful for the work of those members of the university community who served as ushers, and to you, the civil society, participants who graced us with your presence and idea on the floor and both online. Thank you all so much.